uh, Lewis is here from Caroline County. He's an ag agent in Caroline County, and Jimmy's been doing some uh, research on soybeans and poultry litter. So it seems like farmers either like, like litter with soybeans or they don't, but here's what Jimmy's found out in his research. So Jimmy, thanks for coming today. Okay, so I first want to thank the, uh, the Maryland Soybean Board for funding some of this research and some of it's mine alone, some of it's mine and Dr. Bob Craddeville. Uh, he shared some of the same thing across the state for the, over the winter meetings. First I'll talk about the uh, maturity groups. So at the, um, at the Y Research Center over the past four or five years, uh, I've done some research with maturity groups at different planting dates, basically just trying to simulate full season, uh, an early double crop, and then maybe a late double crop date. Um, and why I did this, and this is actually an aerial picture that I think Joe took with a drone or UAV maybe before he was even supposed to, so maybe we'll say it was out of a parachute as you were jumping out of a plane or something. But anyway, just a, a picture of the, the research study area. So anyway, why I did this, um, I was at a meeting a few years ago, Lower Pennsylvania, they were growing 70, 80 bushel beans five or six years ago. ago I was at a meeting talking about slugs. I got to talking with a guy over dinner and they were growing threes to three twos is where they were growing these high, high yielding beans. And at the time, I farm a little bit myself, a couple hundred acres. I couldn't seem to grow over 70 or 80 bushel of beans and they were doing that dry land and I, I couldn't get over that with irrigation. Um, the other thing I found, a, a couple of irrigated studies in Virginia and they were getting their best yields with three fours to three sixes and they were further south than we were. We were growing a lot of fours and I was wondering whether we were growing too long of a bean here. And then in Kentucky, which is about the same elevation across the country as Virginia, they were having their best yields with three fives. Now they don't have any irrigation, but I was looking at the years that they had good rainfall. They were tracking rainfall pattern with their variety trials. So the years that were similar to what we would do with irrigation, they were getting their best yields with three fives. So um, we, I used uh, three varieties in each maturity group. Um, and I'll show you the maturity groups that I broke this down in, in a minute. Um, they weren't three varieties from one company. They were, there was a mixture, so this wasn't all Pioneer, it wasn't all Asgro, it wasn't all Southern States. There was a mixture in there. Um, and I wanted, wanted it that way because everybody rates their, their maturity groups just a little bit different. And a 3-2 three, three Southern States may not be the same as a 3-2 from uh, Pioneer, but they're pretty close. Um, but anyway, I just didn't want one company's groups in here, and I didn't want to look at just one variety because you can have Sometimes one variety does better than you know, other varieties in the same group. So anyway, it's three varieties. Um, the irrigation was done based on following tensiometers, not on maturity stage of the beans. And we all know we don't want to irrigate beans early or else you grow a big plant and they don't seem to yield as well. Um, however, the, the problem always is that I found, okay, if I plant a mid or a late four, which is yielded well, I don't want to irrigate it early. I don't want it to grow early, but if mother nature provides that moisture early, then I end up with this tall plant. And I can't get rid of that water, I can't put a tent over the field. So I wanted to simulate the, the situations that we couldn't control. I can always add plenty of water, I just can't get rid of it. I can't keep mother nature from making it rain. So we did the irrigation, or I did the irrigation based on that pattern. I met the, the guys at the Y tracked the moisture in the soil and um, Joe, actually Joe tracked most of the water at the soil and then provided the irrigation based on the tensiometers. Um, they Fungicides and insecticides used based on IPM, we're not in the business of just um, carte blanche putting fungicides or insecticides on every field. There's been lots of research on that. Sometimes it seems to work, sometimes it doesn't. If we had an insect problem, there was an insecticide spray, to fung a disease problem spray to fungicide. The plots were kept weed free. Um, seven inch rows, seven rows, 15 inch rows, uh, 50 to 75 foot long depending on the field that we were in, how well it worked out. The fertility levels obviously at the Y Research Farmer in the, the optimum good range. Uh, they're not excessive, but they're not poor, so these are good growing conditions, good soils. And then three to four replicates depending on the year. And this is just a picture of the, the plot combine. So it is basically a sim similar to a commercial combine. Combine is just cutting five foot at a time, not 25 to 40 foot at a time. So irrigated, this is, and this is over, planted mid-May, over three years. Um, Actually, this is an average relative yield. I need to take this off. I went back and actually put the real yields in here. So the, the maturity groups I mentioned before, over here, the two to two fives, on up to five to five three. So these are the groups that, we, that I broke it down into. Um, and as you can see here, all these from the, the two sixes on up, these are all not statistically different. 
no, no statistical difference. These are the, the, the groups that seem to yield the best. Um, the risk with, plant, with planting on doing a 2 to a 2.9 in that range, if you plant those in June, they're not going to yield as well in most cases. So I'm not sure about your seed supplier, but my, my seed supplier is not going to be real happy if I have a truckload of these that I intend on planting in mid-May or early May and I don't get them planted and I want to return them for a, for a three or a four. There's only so many times they're going to want to take my beans back. So I think it's risky to try to plan, plan on planting an early two and then have, have it be a wet spring and we don't get it planted or have it be a cool spring and we don't get it planted. So I think we're, these full, the full season beans, we're better off in this three to three, five, three, seven range. And that's what I've found on, on my farm also. So a mid-June planting date, um, which this is gonna be barley beans, really early wheat beans in some years, but typically barley beans. Um, sort of as I expected, this one actually worked out as I expected it would. The late fours yielded better, they have more time to grow. Um, because as we've talked about before, beans are flowering based on day length or, day length or nighttime length. So these late fours have more time to grow before they flower rather than coming up and flowering right away. So it really wasn't that surprising. And these two here are the ones that are not really any statistical difference. Those early to mid fours, the whole group of fours seem to yield the best. And even this planting date, the fives still didn't prove to be beneficial. So I'm not really sure why in the state of Maryland anywhere we would be growing a group five. It's gonna have to be some particular really good yielding bean to wanna grow, for me to wanna grow a group five. Just the data just doesn't seem to show that. So in mid-July, and this is a couple years ago, we had a late, a late wheat harvest. People were still harvesting wheat the first part of July. Or, and this is all irrigation related, or irrigated studies. So we have a lot of vegetable producers that are harvesting, whether it's peas or an early sweet corn crop, mid-July and then following that with, with beans that are irrigated. So um, we dropped out, just like in the previous study, dropped out the twos because that's just, they're gonna come up and flower and they're gonna be six or eight inches tall and you're never gonna get them in the combine. But this one surprised me. This is uh, over three years. There really wasn't any statistical difference in any of these except for the fives. I think what happened, the early threes, um, they were short plants, but they did mature. Some of the late fours, they just run out of time at the end of the year. Not that they got frosted, but they just didn't fully, completely fill out before it got cold. The bean size was small. Uh, so when you get to planting late, I'm not sure it really matters as long as you're anywhere in the, the three to fours, just stay away from the fives and the twos, and I think you'll be okay. Now, these yields are, as you would expect, are really um, depressed or you know, suppressed yields. They're nothing over 50. If we back up a little bit, the, the early double crop, they're, the best ones are around 60 bushels, and the full season in the you know, 80, 90 bushel range, which is what we're starting to see with irrigated beans nowadays. Go back up here. Any, before I go on to manure and nitrogen, anybody have any questions on, on this? I'll be around through lunch. I'm not going to pass up lunch, so I'll be here if anybody wants to catch me. Um, the other thing I want to add is um, the soil was kept moist all season, like I mentioned at the beginning. Um, there does seem to be a little bit of variation from year to year. I think this light quality in our area is really important. I see be our better corn yields and our better bean yields on long sunny days more so than the cloudy days. We start getting a lot of cloudy weather and it seems like we have lower corn yields and bean yields. Anyway, okay, so moving on to nitrogen on soybeans. What about nitrogen for soybeans? So we have, we're putting, there, there's inputs in the system, nitrogen, whether we're adding it or whether um, it's there and we're, we're harvesting and taking nitrogen off the field with beans, with the, the crop. So over, over this, this was done um, a few years ago. Uh, 57 different studies of um, one bushel of beans was, the, the amount of nitrogen in a bushel of beans was 3.8 pounds of nitrogen. So every bushel of beans you haul off the field, you're hauling 3.8 pounds of nitrogen away. How many, so what that amounts to is even 40 bushel beans, 150 pounds of nitrogen. Who's putting 150 pounds of nitrogen on beans? Hopefully nobody in here, okay. So where is this all coming from? Um, of that, about 60%, this is just looking at 40 bushel beans, but 60% uh, of that nitrogen is coming from fixation. So on the roots, these little pink dots here are supposed to simulate nodules. So I think everybody knows by now you pull up a bean plant, there's nodules on the roots. It's this uh, Rhizobia japonica bacteria that's actually living with the roots, it's producing nitrogen, taking nitrogen out of the air, producing um, nitrogen that then the plant is growing off of, they're attached to a root so it's going to the system. 
the remainder is coming from mineralization of soil or organic matter. Um, so in this case, which I'm looking at a little bar up there, it's hard to tell, but um, the remaining should be like 60 pounds or something. It's coming from uh, the, the soil organic matter. So if you have a good soil, it could be producing a little bit more. Poor soil could be a, a little bit less. Uh, but it's coming from your soil organic matter. If anybody has any questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand and we'll try to answer them. So the question always is high yielding soybeans. I was looking at 40 bushel beans. The soil's capable of producing that much. Um, what happens if you have high yielding beans? Can the nodules produce the extra? Can more come from the soil? So on this graph chart, um, and it's gonna be really hard to see these colors, but that is the total, that where the arrow is there, the straight line, is the total nitrogen uptake. Um, on across the bottom is uh, grain yield and bushels, and up this side is um, pounds of nitrogen per acre that's being needed to grow the crop. So not only what's in the seed, but also what's in the leaves, stems, and so forth. So the bottom line is what's coming from your soil, from your soil nitrogen. Uh, that's from the organic matter that's breaking down over the summer. As it warms up, it rains. Um, some of that will break down. This line is the, the amount that the plant is fixing, those little um, nodules, what they're fixing. And then the, the uh, green line is the total of the orange or mustard colored line and the blue line. So somewhere in this range of about 60 bushels, this line starts to separate. And the, the worry is, is there may be an um, a, a, a insufficient amount or a deficiency level show up if you're growing uh, 100 bushel beans or 120 bushel beans, the difference between what, what's in the soil and what the nodules can fix. Now, the argument that I always have with this, this is always seems to be done with 40, to, the research is done with 40, 50, 60 bushel beans. That's partially because up until the last couple years, we haven't grown too many fields of over 70, 80, 90 bushel beans to do this research in. So up until this point, it's sort of theoretical that beans can't produce enough nitrogen to, to grow the high yields, but there really hasn't been research done on those high yielding beans. Uh, so I, I, I question whether or not the nodules are capable of this fixed nitrogen. Does this line really keep going up in high yielding beans? And that's really still yet to be seen. So the current research consensus for nitrogen on soybeans or the, the questions that are out there is, is going to help. Um, there's been studies done all over the country for the past 10, 15, 20 years. Will we see a response? And it seems like only occasionally. I didn't want to just bore you with all, the, all those studies, but there's lots and lots of studies of where they put nitrogen on. They got a little response. A lot of times they didn't get any response. And then where they did get a response, is it going to be profitable? Is it worth spending $20 in nitrogen to get $8 worth of beans back? Uh, so this is where it depends on the, the cost and the, the price. If beans were 15 bucks and nitrogen was 20 cents, it probably would pay a lot more times than it, than it does at $40 nitrogen and 950 beans. So what are the situations when it may be beneficial, potentially these high yield environments of 80 plus bushel beans? Uh, so in, in um, in the soybean, and you can see here the, the nitrogens in the stem, the petioles, the leaves, the pods, the beans, and then over here, this color, these are fallen leaves and petioles that are falling off the plant at the end of the year. So the maturity, plant the beans, harvest the beans, it comes across here roughly days, either the stage is vegetative and then reproductive. Rough dates, but these all do vary a little bit. Um, this side, this is um, percent of total nitrogen, so this is not pounds. In some crops, this could be 300. In some crops, it could be 500. Depends on the, the crop. So if we go back and look, when I, we were talking before about 3.8 pounds per bushel, if it was 50 bushel beans, 60% uh, of it, you're hauling off the field. Some of the nitrogen stay in there in leaf material. It's falling to the ground. Uh, some is in the pods. There's a little bit that's in the, in, in the stem left. Um, but anyway, this just explains where the nitrogen is. So the if, if you look here, when the nitrogen use, just like in corn, as the plant starts getting bigger, it start, starts using a lot more nitrogen. And the general consensus is that if you're ever going to see a response, it's because the plant's going to start using a lot more here. This is where you're going to need to add it, not out here because it's going to be too late, not over here because it's going to be too early and it's susceptible to leach away, just like you don't want to put all your nitrogen on corn when you plant it. Uh, so the, the general consensus is if you're ever going to see a response, it's going to be in this time when the beans start to blossom. Uh, and the beginning of pod fill. So this is where a lot of people have tried adding 20 to 40 pounds. 
No guarantee it's going to help those I just mentioned. So there's been work done in Maryland. Uh, the DL is dry land, dry land, irrigated dry land. These are sites around the state. Uh, all these sites had a little bit of residual nitrogen, 20 to 30 pounds in the top 12 inches. Pretty much any soil in the state of Maryland, if you go out and take a soil sample, you're going to find a little bit of nitrogen there just because it's always continually breaking down from the organic matter. So this is, just, this is normal. This isn't like it's beans after a, a crappy corn crop that left a lot of nitrogen, or this isn't like it's after a big manure application or plowing under a green manure crop. Just typical soil. A couple different varieties. Application timing, pre-plant R1, R3, and then the rates were 0, 0.25 and 50 pounds per acre. So here's the results. Um, the check, nothing added at all. So these were just under 50 bushel beans. Across this side is 25 pounds of planting, 25 pounds at R1. This is flowering. Um, 25 pounds at R3, then 50 pounds at each of these also. So as you can see here, there's real, this, this is not statistically different. So there was, while there's a little bit of response uh, at this 50 pounds at R1, it's not a whole lot and it's not statistically different than a check. And oh, I'm not sure what happened to my, it must have got cut off over here. I actually had on the slide, um, or when it transferred from my computer, this one. So even this, if I remember right, um, 1.7 bushels, I think, so if I do the math, 40, yeah, I think it's 1.7 bushels. Even at $10 beans, that's 17 bucks. Can you buy 50 pounds of nitrogen and apply it for $17? I'm not, I don't think so. I think you're going to lose about 8 or 10 $11 an acre by doing this. Maybe if you do more acres, it gets cheaper. I don't know. You're going to lose, you're going to lose $11 an acre. Yes? Did you mention how you're buying the nitrogen? This was all surface applied. The broadcast UAN. We're not, we weren't, it wasn't incorporated. And this wasn't irrigated, it wasn't run through the system. Uh, but they were, they were actually low yielding beans. Um, so then looking at poultry manure, and I don't need to read this to you, but um, so in this state we know we have, well, a lot of people think, seem to think we have excess manure. If you talk to people in this part of the country, you would think that there's a shortage of manure. Um, I know in Carolina we still have trouble getting manure. I think up here there's a problem getting as much manure as we need, but for some reason people in the state seem to think there's an excess. But if there is an excess or it's available, can we use poultry manure to supply nitrogen to beans or will poultry manure, um, with the other nutrients that are in it, help soybeans? There's a transport program available, and then I do want to mention, people say, well, can we legally do this? Um, in the nutrient reg regs, there's actually a section on manure, which I don't expect you to read that, so I blew it up so you can, so you can read it here. Um, Nitrogen is not needed for soybean production, however, in order to meet crop needs for phosphorus, organic nutrients, including manure, may be applied at up to 50 pounds per, per, of nitrogen per acre. So if it's manure that has, um, 25 pounds per ton, you could use two tons. 50 pounds per ton, which would really be good manure, you can only use one ton. Uh, the rate cannot exceed the phosphorus limits imposed by the P-site index calculation. Um, so if you have high phosphorus levels, then you can't do this, but you can do it if you have low phosphorus levels. Am I correct, Howard? There we go. Right, if, correct, if the, when you go through the PMT, right. Okay, so we, this, uh, once again, the Soybean Board funded this work. I did, um, we did this for two years, looking at um, putting manure on beans and irrigated fields. So we did this once at my farm, once at one place at the Y, for two years. So there's four site locations. An average plant, and mine was in Caroline County. Average planting date of May 27th. So we were shooting for the end of, end of May, last week of May, typical bean planting time. Planned the field the way we would normally plant the field. Um, I think at the Y, both years were 15-inch rows. On mine, one year was 15, one year was 7, just because last year I got behind planting with 15s and needed to run two planters at a time, so this field got the drilled beans. Um, I don't think I stuck population on here. Population in the 135 to 150,000 range, depending on the year, depending on the seed size and what we were planting with. So the treatments, um, the poultry mill was analyzed, and then we applied this one and a half tons at planting by hand, spread over top of these beans after we planted them. Um, and then we looked at using, because I've always said, um, people put manure on beans and swear they get a response. Well, then I always ask, well, did you get a response from the nitrogen, from micronutrients in it, from did you need potash, did you need sulfur, did you need phosphorus, what were your fertility levels? So to try to figure out which one of those things we were seeing a response from, because we went into this assuming we were going to see a response, 
One treatment was actually ammonium nitrate used in 34-00 at planting, and then at R2, which is full flower. So we went out there at planting and spread some ammonium nitrate. Then the other treatment was when it was, when it was flowering, um, spread ammonium nitrate. Use triple superphosphate for a phosphorus source, muriate potash for the potassium source, a granulated sulfur product that was, actually I think it was 0090 or triple 090, and then the control was nothing at all. So these fields had good fertility levels. Um, some of this was done by hand, some was done with the uh, Gandhi fertilizer spreader um, pulled behind the, or three pointed behind the tractor. Um, good fertility levels to start with, good pH levels. Um, we didn't, because we, we sort of went into this thinking, well, if there's a phosphorus deficiency or a potash deficiency, of course we would see a response. Uh, typically on fields, that, a lot of fields that are receiving manure on beans have high P and K levels because they've been using manure on corn. They're not typically buying manure to put it on beans. It's because you have excess manure you're trying to get rid of. So we had good fertility levels to start with. So just to show the amounts that were in the manure, and this is pretty good manure, but this is what was actually in the manure. So at this one and a half ton rate, we were getting 127 pounds of, of potash. Um, I think this says 18 pounds of sulfur here. Anyway, so we used the fertilizers to give us the same 47 pounds that were in the ton and a half, 74 pounds of phosphorus that was in the ton and a half, 127 and 18. So we were just simulating the manure nutrients in this commercial fertilizer nutrient treatment. Uh, before I show you the data, I just want to show you, so this is the, and this doesn't show up real well at all, this is the field map from my farm. Um, when Bob, Bob harvests, harvests these with that plot combine, I had actually harvested the field before he got there, so what was left, this is where the plot was in the, in the edge of this field. This is a corn field, so I did this so we could drive across the corn to get to it. It just made it easier to harvest, and it's a uniform spot in the field. Um, so just to blow up that area, Bob always asks, well, how are the beans doing? And I'm always you know, trying to check how well the plot combine does to mine. So this whole field, if I had to separate out the dry land and the irrigated part, the irrigated part would have been right around 100 bushels per acre. The whole thing, I think, ended up doing 88. Anyway, so we actually had, and you can see irrigation tracks here, and I think there's, well, I could see it before if I go back. Um, uh, it's kind of hard to, it's hard to see there anyway. On my computer, I could see it. There's two towers worth of, there's one tower that goes around here, the next set of wheels goes through here, and a set of wheels goes through here. It's actually replicated six times. So we did all seven treatments in this area, all seven treatments here, all seven treatments here, and so on. So they were 15 foot wide, like 50 foot long, or might be 65 foot long, because the three times 65 got us between the 205 foot spans. Um, Anyway, around this plot, these beans were doing between 90 and, or 85 and 100 bushels, some 105. Um, and when Bob got done harvesting with the plot combine, they were in the, about five bushels less. The plot combine, for some reason, loses some beans. Every year we run in there, we look at it, there's beans on the ground. We can never seem to get it adjusted to not lose beans. Maybe it's because it's a Massey Ferguson. I don't have any idea. If I paint it green, maybe it'll, it'll work better. Anyhow, so we averaged two years at my field, two years at the Y. The Y typically seems to yield about 10 bushels less, but they're using, I'm planting mid threes. They're using a longer maturity group bean. They just don't seem to yield as well. Um, so these are, uh, there's no statistical difference here. One and a half tons of poultry litter, um, ammonium nitrate at planting, ammonium nitrate at that's R2. Uh, this one was the phosphorus, potash, sulfur, and then this is the control with nothing added whatsoever. Um, so we added a ton of manure, we added nitrogen, all these things we did. This was a, both of these are irrigated sites. Mine never hurt for water the, at the Y. Joe followed the tensiometers, they never hurt for water, so these beans never suffered. Um, at my place, they were, these yields were typically about 10 bushels higher than this, that the Y, they were a little bit less than the average together to, to equal these yields. Uh, anybody have any questions on that? Anybody tried this and experienced something different? No, anybody tried this and got the same results? Okay. <laughs> um, the other thing, after we did this the first year, I did ask, I told Bob, I said, you know, we probably ought to do some nitrate checks in the fall because if this does prove to be beneficial, we all know that there's going to be some environmental concern over us putting nitrogen on beans or manure on beans that they really don't need it. Is there going to be nitrogen left at the fall, in the fall? So we didn't do nitrogen checks or test where the sulfur, potash, or phosphorus was, but we followed this with a nit we checked the soil nitrate level 
where, the, um, where nothing was applied or where we added manure or nitrogen. And there was all the residual nitrates. It didn't matter whether we had put manure or nitrogen or this check, they were all less than 10 parts per million. So had we been growing wheat after this, we still wouldn't have been able to add, add nitrogen to the, the small grain crop in the fall, which is, ex I mean, that's what we expect. And when you add nitrogen to beans, they're gonna use that before the nodules are gonna be active. So just a summary, this is similar to what other people have found everywhere in the country. If you don't have a deficiency, it seems like there's not really gonna be a response. Um, and we haven't found, been able to find any evidence that two different farms, um, not in large, large field size, but we know we're harvesting five foot, uh, 65 foot long and it's replicated um, you know, six times and we're still not getting any response. Uh, however, if anybody wants to do more research, there's an exemption for farmer cooperatives to do research with MDA. Howard can help you work, um, work through those applications um, and you can try this on your own farm. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, the, I think the paper said I was going to talk for an hour. Well, I wasn't going to hold you up from lunch for <laughs> talking for an hour. I'll be here through lunch if anybody has it. Yes? What did you, how did you treat your part of the field as opposed to the The question was, how did I treat my part of the field as opposed to, as opposed to the plot? Mine had, mine, I planted the, the phosphorus, the potash levels were sufficient. I planted the field, come back a month later with Touch, they were Roundup Ready beans, touchdown and manganese. Matter of fact, the plot got manganese also because I have manganese deficient soils. So the whole, my whole farm got manganese over it and we did the herbicide application. The herbicide application went right over the, the, right through the plot, just like everything else, that's it, irrigated it. No insecticide, no fungicide, no additional, nothing through the pivot, that was it. So your, your, your part of the field was more or less the same as the check? It was all, yes, yes. Yeah, and, and I didn't pull out just my one of the four years data there on that one we just showed the yield map but when Bob got there he said well how's the, how did the field do and I said well the field did the irrigated part should be right around 100 at that time I didn't have the map back yet um, but I had watched the monitor as I went around the plot and I knew that it was doing between 85 and 100 so I said we should get if we don't get 85 to 100 out of your part of it something's wrong with the combine or something's wrong one way or the other and of course as soon as we started just like every year when we start with this combine there's beans on the ground and we tinker with it and can never seem to get it from losing five or 10 bushels of beans. But it's consistent from one treatment to the next, it's gonna lose some beans. A couple other people that sponsored uh, was um, Scott Quinn from Ag Technology Group. I don't think he's, I think he's probably out in the other room. Um, Alan Corman and Son, um, Eric Paneri, um, let's see else, Hubers, uh, and Sunrise Solar. So make sure that you visit all of our sponsors. Mm -hmm.